too. Yeah. I hung out my mask right. pin. I'm representing, okay? You are representing. I'm not playing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it? All right, we're going to keep going now? Okay. So you, everything you touch, you want to make it better, which is perfect. That's why Mark Cuban hired you. Yes, I want to make it better. And he wanted to make the workplace better. He wanted to really create a great place to work for his employees. Give us an idea of how bad it was when you arrived here in 2018. And let's just be straight up. Okay, so, you know, we know there's a Sports Illustrated article that described a toxic culture. And it was a culture that, the way I describe it, was not a great place to work for women or people of color. Or frankly, it was just not a great place to work, what I know to be a great place to work. And so there were just issues that needed to be addressed around values, around diversity, equity, and inclusion, around fairness, and just, uh, we just needed to have a transformation. And he knew that. He knew that. In your first 100 days, uh, you came up with a plan to change the culture at the Mavs. Tell us about that plan and what it's like now. Okay, so that plan was really about, it was in four areas. Uh, it was around just really modeling zero tolerance. So what does it look like to have a workplace where there are just certain things that we won't put up with? Not that they won't occur, but when they occur, when they're proven, we don't have tolerance for it. So we're not trying to guarantee a workplace is free of problems, but we won't tolerate those uh, issues. And so inappropriate behavior, sexual harassment, misconduct, uh, we put some processes in place to make sure that people felt free to report those things and then that we could investigate those fairly and then take the appropriate action. Uh, so model zero tolerance, uh, an agenda for women, uh, that was the second piece. And we laid out an express agenda for women, things that we would do to educate, uh, empower, uh, elevate women and show that women could really thrive and have careers uh, in sports and in male dominated uh, areas. Uh, then there was a third piece around cultural transformation, and that's where the whole diversity, equity, and inclusion piece came in. Employee engagement, how do we create a culture uh, where every voice matters and everybody belongs, which is our workplace promise. That's what we put together, that every voice matters and everybody belongs. If you work at the Dallas Mavericks, uh, we can guarantee that. And then the fourth piece was just operational effectiveness. What are just the basic things we need to run a great business? Performance reviews. Uh, making sure we don't have, you know, that we have pay equity, uh, all those kinds of things. And so it was 200 initiatives. The employees ran, uh, rallied around them. Uh, it started with a vision that said we would set the global standard in the NBA for diversity and inclusion by the end of that year, which was crazy. So we had like nine months to get it done. And then a set of values. Our values spell crafts, character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety both physical and emotional safety. We had a big need to focus on emotional safety. A lot of people were going through a lot of things. At the time I walked in, there was an investigation going on and all that. Uh, so we laid out the vision, the values, the 100-day plan, and everybody rallied around it. We had to yeah, make some personnel changes. And um, I'm proud of our team. I mean, I just kind of laid out a vision and, and, and laid out the items, but uh, great people executed on it. Great people. So now comes the roll your eyes moment because you were brought in to the Dallas Mavericks as that agent of change. And now yes. these recent allegations against the Mavericks feel like a regression. No, we haven't regressed. I mean, we're not guaranteeing that bad things won't happen. Uh, we're saying it's about how you respond to it. Now, hopefully you don't, you know, we don't have a lot of bad things to happen. I think you could put our record up to probably any uh, employer and our folks will tell you we have a great place to work. We just won the NBA's Inclusion Leadership Award second time in a row. Okay, we, uh, we, are, we are a great place to work. And, but we have normal issues, normal things come up on the basketball and business side, and we address those. We address those when they happen, and sometimes some things aren't true, uh, but we try to address that too. We try to address that too. We take every, everything that's brought to us, we take it very seriously. We have to respond immediately like it's true. Uh, we try to stay out of the headlines, but sometimes that can, hap ha can happen. Uh, and we take it all very seriously because people's lives are at stake. People's careers are at stake. Their reputations, uh, our brand is at stake. Uh, so many people, uh, customers, I mean, 20,000 people in this arena, they trust us. And so that, that's important to us. So we take every allegation seriously and we respond to it.
And so I feel good about uh, where we are. It's not the place I walked into in 2018. Uh, the culture is different. Uh, a lot of the people are different. And I, I love, I love our team. I love our team on the court and off the court. How do people view you as the fixer? I'm not the fixer. I mean, somebody called me Olivia Pope. I said, that's crazy. I mean, I do have like this little trench coat because I had to play her one time uh, when I was at at and in something we had. But I think I'm the person who had to come in and lead change. Uh, and that was the mandate. I mean, Mark Cuban's mandate to me was to transform the culture. Uh, in, in so many words, create a great place to work, whatever that takes. I, I was blessed enough to be able to be to lead that effort at at and that landed us on Fortune's Great Place to Work list in 2017 for the first time ever. Uh, and so I know what it takes, how to rally a bunch of people together, because you can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. How to rally people together, match them to the jobs that they're in. It's great when you have a leader who wants that to happen. So, you know, kudos to my boss for recognizing we need to focus on this area. And so um, I fixed what I could, but it's all of us. It's all of us. You say you, you talk about your boss. What have you learned from Mark Cuban? Okay, so what I've learned from Mark Cuban is um, uh, to move quickly. There are some things that uh, we might try. He's so innovative, okay? Mm -hmm. So I learned, I learned how to be innovative, but also just move quickly. If it works, great. And if it doesn't, move quickly and just get onto something else. We've tried things here in this arena that didn't work. He's like, okay, let's move on to the next idea. Uh, mm -hmm. So I like that. I like the fact that he just doesn't, you know, dwell uh, in things that, you know, we just got to keep it going and keep it moving. Uh, I've learned the business of basketball. Uh, that's the main thing I've learned from him because I didn't know the business of basketball. Uh, when I started here, I worked in uh, telecommunications and communications and entertainment. I mean, I worked there 36 years. So we evolved from being a phone company to communication and entertainment. That's the space I was in for 36 years. I didn't know a thing about the business of basketball. And I've read somewhere that you didn't even know who Mark Cuban was. I know some people don't believe that, but I don't care that they don't believe it because I did not know who he was. And we joke because I said he didn't know me either. OK, so so, so so we're even. But actually, I think that says a whole lot about him that he didn't just he didn't call somebody he knew. OK, and he wasn't trying to cover up something. I mean, he called somebody he absolutely didn't know, but who had a reputation uh, for being a strong leader and for being able to uh, transform cultures. And he took a chance that uh, everything he heard was true. And he wasn't trying to get a friend, you know, to, to bail about or something. He really wanted to create a great place to work. One word. How do you transform culture? Trust. You create an environment of trust where people trust that you're, go you're going to do as a leader what you say you're going to do. Uh, they have to trust you to be able to speak up and tell you what's wrong in a place. They have to trust that you're going to respond to what they tell you that is wrong. They have to trust that you have their best interests at heart, personally and professionally, which is why I had a one-on-one -on -one with every single employee with the Mavs when I got there. I wanted these folks to know that I cared about them as people, and I wanted them to be able to trust me. So you start uh, with that. Uh, we have our business plan and all that laid out in a pyramid. And on one side, it talks about uh, return on investment, is key to our success. Then it says agility uh, is critical to our success. And the base of it says trust accelerates our success. And so the speed of trust, we, we all know about it. We know the book. It is real. And so we can get a lot done and we can get it done very quickly if trust is there. Let's flip it. What has Mark Cuban learned from St. Marshall? You know, it's interesting. My son just sent me something that somebody sent him when Mark Cuban was actually talking about me in an interview uh, with Chris Paul. And what he said he's learned is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, kind of the importance of it, uh, the differences, uh, the difference between diversity and inclusion, and the right approach to take uh, with people. So he said he's learned that with me. He's learned about cultures and uh, kind of how to drive uh, people to really wanting to do a, a great job. So that's what he said. That's what he said. So I guess that's what he's learned from me. And I've learned from him a whole lot about the business of basketball. <clears throat> well, talking about the business of basketball, uh, when, you, when you took this gig, like you said, you, you, you wanted to set the NBA standard for diversity and inclusion. Uh, obviously, Nico Harrison is a person of color yes. on the basketball side. In what other ways are you trying to fulfill that promise? Okay, so what, what we, we laid out an actual... Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. So the way our values spell crafts, 
We have a DEI agenda that we also laid out as part of the 100 day plan that also spells craft. So it's about our customers. Uh, so making sure we are serving our customers in the diverse ways they need them to service, but also that we have diverse customers and fans yeah. uh, in the arena. Uh, reputation uh, for a great place to work, our agenda for women, family, and our family meaning home, work, and community. Uh, the community is part of our family. And so what are we doing in the community? Where are the philanthropic dollars going? Are they going all over uh, the region and not just in a certain place? Are we serving uh, South Dallas and uh, other areas where we have you know, underrepresented people? Are we uh, really putting our money into schools and children who need us? So all that kind of stuff. And then talent, of course, our workforce. We want a diverse workforce. We want uh, women and just people of color, white people, everybody uh, to feel great about working there. We want to see them at every table. And so when I got to the Mavs, there weren't any women in permanent leadership positions or people of color in leadership positions. And then now our leadership team is 50% women and 50% people of color. And so we love that. And of course, Mark's executive team, look at us. And so we want it, we, and, and then the S is for suppliers and sponsors. So we laid out an expressed agenda and we laid out key performance indicators and said, we're gonna be serious about making sure that everyone is being served internally and externally. And so the whole community, has wrapped around us. I mean, you know, we have our whole social justice, math, take action plan. People have rallied around us. I love this community. So we laid it out, but we were serious about, we didn't just want to talk about it. We wanted to be about it. And so we documented it. This, this is uh, wonderful, but it also sounds very exhausting. How in the world did you, uh, were you able to do this along with family? You know, there's so much in, how do you do it all? My, my kids are used to it. I mean, I've been a hardworking woman for a long time. Uh, I was an executive when we adopted all of our kids. Uh, so they're just used to it. And so the way I do it all, I talk about rubber balls and crystal balls. Uh, crystal balls are those balls, if, they, if you drop it, it shatters and never comes back. Not everything is crystal. Most things aren't crystal. So know what's really important. So I do that at work. I do that at home. I set my priorities. I know what absolutely I can't drop. And then some things are rubber. I can drop them, they'll bounce back, either they're gonna bounce to you and you're gonna take it for me because you're a great team player, or it's gonna bounce away and never come back because maybe it didn't need to happen anyway, or to bounce back to me later. So I really practice that concept and I talk about it a lot. And so I do it at home and at work and I try to set my priorities and I'm surrounded by great people. I am surrounded by great people. We had uh, great folks already there. I brought in some people, we promoted some folks. I mean, they're just, wonderful people. You have to come and visit us. You will be so inspired by the employees at the Mavs. And then, of course, we put together, when I got there, the Dallas Mavericks Advisory Council, DMAC. Mm -hmm. And it's a group of about uh, 30 external people. And I can name some of them and you would know them. Uh, these are people in the community, people in business, people in the public policy arena. I mean, folks, uh, academia, folks who have come together to say, we will be your external advisors. And so we run things by them. Uh, we run our marketing stuff, buying, branding things. I mean, they just help us. Uh, they're sounding board for us. But then they also bring us things that we might need to be aware of. And so it's great. And so I meet with them quarterly. And uh, they advise us because you need that outside eye to help you. And so and then they help us, you know, kind of fill up this place. And you, so it's good. You talk about the four children who you adopted. You know, that's not really something we hear a lot about. We hear about the domestic abuse growing up. The cancer, yes, um, and and um, really rising above and as a woman of color, you know, to be an executive. But the children, mm. tell us, tell us about your story. Um, you adopted four children from yes. foster care. Yes, so they're my babies. I love my honeys. I mean, I call them all honeys. Uh, they're all growing up now. Uh, but my husband and I had four second trimester miscarriages and a daughter who died at six months old. Uh, she was four months premature. And so that's how we spent the first 10 years of our marriage. And it became very clear to us that the Lord had another way to make our family. And through a series of circumstances, we showed up at an adoption meeting one night where I didn't want to be there. Uh, and we heard about a two-year-old boy. We heard this the next day, okay? A two-year-old boy who had been abandoned uh, when he was nine months old uh, with his nine-year-old brother taking care of him. And uh, for two months, the police didn't even know that these boys were abandoned. And uh, through this meeting and all that, uh, we ended up uh, connecting with him. Uh, 
the plan was to put him in a long-term group home. And uh, literally, at the age of two, at the age of two, the social workers had left the plan on the judge's desk the very night we showed up to a meeting. And we ended up saying we were interested in a two-year-old black boy. And of course, they thought of this little one. And they retrieved the file off the judge's desk the next morning and gave us a call. And the rest is history. He's almost 30 now. And, you know, it, it was tough. I mean, it was tough because he had lots of issues, which a lot of kids do, as you well know. A lot of kids that are in foster care, they're born drug exposed. They have a lot of things going on in their life. And so we were able to get him. Later, we were able to reconnect with his 14-year-old brother. Okay, so once he, when he was five years old, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to connect with him. So we got them back together. They only wanted us to give pictures, and it resulted in us getting them back together. Uh, so then we got Ricky and then talk I, about the moment. Oh, uh, I'll never forget it. So we show up with back. It was back in the day. So all these photo albums, I had taken a bajillion pictures of Anthony and they said, well, he just wants to see pictures of his brother. Their birth mom had died. And so he took that hard and he said, well, whatever happened to my little brother? Because I think he had only seen him once, once they were separated. And we said, you know what? We will take the pictures. We want to meet this young man. So we go to meet him. And we show him the pictures. He is sobbing. The whole scene was beautiful. And we just told the foster mother, we said, we want to reunite them tonight. And so Anthony was on a little play date. We called the parents and we said, we want Anthony to open the door. We want him to open the door so Ricky can see his little brother who he hasn't seen for so long, right? And so we were all sitting there in the car and we told Ricky, he's 14. We said, you go up to the door. Just go ring the doorbell. And when he rang the doorbell, I still see it. It makes me emotional. I can still see it. Uh, Ricky opened the door. It was 25 years ago. And Anthony looked up at him and he said, my brother? Because my husband had like drilled it in him. It's not your cousin because he had a bunch of cousins. This is your brother. This is the person who saved your life. This is your brother. And Ricky just started sobbing and he just picked him up. And it was just absolutely beautiful. I mean, they were back together. I mean, he was there when the boy was born. And Ricky has told us so many stories since then about the abuse and the trauma and what happened in those first, um, you know, those first nine months. But we got him back together. And then my son was watching TV one night and he saw it, uh, a Wednesday's child on the San Francisco news. You know all about the Wednesday's child. Okay. Y'all just really call some stuff. Okay. And so he was watching the news. And when I got home from work, he started telling me about this little girl that needed a big brother. Nothing about a mother or a father, but she needed a big brother. He says, and dad says she looks sad, sort of like you did when you were little. And I'm looking at my husband like, thanks. And he said, so I want to make her smile. She needs to be adopted. I want to adopt her the way you guys adopted me. He's five years old. Okay, it was crazy. And I could barely keep up with him. So I'm like, this is not happening. Yeah. And my husband's like, don't worry about it. He said, I made dad call that 100 kind of number. So an 800 number, right? My husband's like, don't worry about it. Yes, he told me to call the number. It's okay. Several hundred people called the news station. You know how it is. Mm -hmm. That boy would pray every single night for the little girl on TV. Every night he says, mom, I have to pray for my little sister. I have to pray for my little sister. So she is now my 27 year old. Okay. So we, we adopted her. So, so we adopted, oh my gosh, it was crazy. And then 10 years later, <sighs> I'm not making this up, Cynthia. We moved to North Carolina and he's watching the news again. And yes, we adopted another one at almost 12 years old. Yes. So when he went off to college, I said, give me the remote control. <laughs> I got the Wednesday's kid, the Friday's kid. The brother who showed up, <laughs> I'm done. And I wouldn't take any of it back. The Lord gave me these kids. The Lord literally made my family. I mean, he took, uh, you know, he took the, you know, the, I had the first miscar four miscarriages and then special K. So she was Carolyn with the K. And so, you know, he took her, but he had a plan. He had a plan. He gave me quadruple for, I always say Job got double for his trouble in the Bible. I got quadruple <laughs> for my trouble. He gave me four beautiful honeys. That's how he meant to make our family. How has Special K, uh, how has Special K 
wrapped her arms around you from heaven, um, thanking you for bringing these children into your lives. Oh, they talk about her all the time. It was so funny because my son early on used to say that was his little sister too, because we always had a picture of Special K sitting out. And he said, that's my little sister, not realizing just, uh, not realizing the ages and how it all worked out. But it's so funny because when I think about it, that is kind of his little sister because he was born in 92, but we didn't know him at the time. She was born in 94. We met him at the end of 94. And we met Shirley in 97, but she was also born in 94. So in 1994, the Lord was orchestrating the whole plan because of Special K. And my, my son told me one time, he goes, Mom, we love Special K. Because if we said we could just feel her, because if she didn't go to heaven, we probably wouldn't be here. And that is true. And so I could just feel her. I always said she was here for a reason. Her doctors at her funeral, her doctors got up and eulogized her and said, Carolyn was here, Special K was here for a reason. Because there was a surgery they didn't know about and we were able to find out about it. And it's something that needed to be done two months prior to when she got it. But at least now the surgery is being done, kids are being saved. So she really was here for a reason. So she was here. And to quote him, he said, Special K was here to teach us that we're not God mm -hmm. and that we don't know everything and that there is a plan. And what he didn't realize is he was speaking to me too, because she was here to also show us that God really does have a plan mm -hmm. and we have to be open to his plan. And his plan was for me to be the mother of these four honeys that I have right now, including her. Yes. Your husband had mentioned to Anthony that, that your daughter who you adopted, she looked sad the way you looked sad when you were a little girl. Why were you sad when you were a little girl? There were days when I was sad. I grew up in a public housing project and grew up in a poverty, so we didn't have a whole lot. But at the time, you don't realize you don't, you know, you don't have a whole lot. Uh, but my father was abusive. Uh, so my mother was uh, just, you know, she's beat up uh, a lot. Uh, when I was 15 years old, my father broke my nose. Uh, and, you know, I had a big brace on my nose going back to school, but I went back to school. Uh, my mother always uh, taught us it's not where you live, it's how you live. And for us to have faith and that the Lord would always bring us through whatever adversity we were going through. And so I always joke about, uh, I said, my mom put two books in my hand at an early age a math book in one hand and a Bible in the other, and said, keep your head in these two books. Stay focused uh, to the degree possible, kind of just ignore just all of this around us. Uh, she kept us in church. Uh, she kept us filled with hope. Uh, she worked a few jobs. And then at 15, she and my father got a divorce, and it was an ugly, violent uh, summer, uh, but we made it through it. And her prayer was that we'd make it back home before school started, because for my mom, education was everything. Uh, my zip code didn't matter. Education did. And so we did make it back home that summer. And I was a junior in high school. I went to school with that brace on my nose from when my dad broke my nose. And three teachers and a principal embraced me. I love educators. I absolutely love educators. I celebrate them a lot. I get others to celebrate them, not just during Teacher Appreciation Week, but every chance I get because they, they reach out to me. They didn't care what was going on in our house. They didn't care that my zip code was 94804. They found out what was going with us. They knew my mother's dream was for her kids to go to college. And they got me on a path. They got me involved in so many activities. I was a smart kid. I had skipped the fifth grade. They wanted me to skip the seventh grade, but my parents wouldn't let me because at some point, you know, it was social and all that. Uh, so they knew they had this smart kid on, on their hands from 94804. And they embraced me, embraced my mom and got me on a path, and I ended up with five full scholarships full scholarship to the college of my choice. How did you break the barriers? By the help of a lot of people, I mean, I, I have four words that I live by. Dream, focus, pray, and act. And that's how I broke it. I was taught to have big dreams, and I had big dreams. And people would show me things, they'd take me places, they would invest in me, and so I always had big dreams. And I had this dream that I was going to be a math teacher. And then I decided, no, because I love numbers, I love math. And then I said, no, I'm going to go and work for a big company, and I'm going to be a, like the boss in a big corporation. So that was a dream I had in college. So I was always exposed to things, uh, but I was also taught to focus, which is why I put my boyfriend on hold for four years while I was in college. I was focused, and he was shocked because he had transferred schools to be near me. And I said... <laughs> 
I'll call you when I graduate. And he couldn't believe it. And Cynthia, the day that I graduated from college, I called him. And he tried to act like he didn't know who I was. I said, hey, it's Sin. I just graduated today. I'm going to start working for the fall camp. He's like, who is this? He said, I haven't talked to you in almost four years. I said, no, no, no. I just graduated. And so he said he couldn't. I told him mom, my mom was having a party. He said he couldn't come to the party. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I kept my word. I said I was going to call you when I graduated. I said, I just graduated at 2 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock. I mean, it's just been one hour. And so he said he couldn't come to the party. He was engaged, all that kind of stuff. And we just celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary. Last, it was Kenny? Last Saturday. Yes, it was Kenny. <laughs> he said he hates it when I tell that story because it's true. It's true. So I tell that story at, when, I, when I do high school commencements. I said, hey. Put them on hold. And so when we move the kids into college, our nieces, nephews, our kids, Kenny's always the one. He goes, don't you have a phone call to make? Don't you guys have a phone call to make? It's a tradition in our family that we just put them on hold until we graduate. <laughs> because I was focused. I mean, because that's what I was told to wow. do was to focus. I stepped on Berkeley's campus. I'm in the middle of that campus. Everything is so big. We got the big Sather Gate up there, the Campanile. I'm 17 years old. I'm a kid out of Eastern Hill Project. This was, this was different for me, but it was also the time where I knew I needed to be big. And all these people had invested in me. I needed to like make this happen. This, this ha something good had to come out of it. And so it did. And then I pray about everything. So Laura, what's the next move? What should I do? Had 13 job offers coming out of school, prayed about you know which ones to take, which was easy. I had two criteria. I want the one with the most money, where I can come in and be the boss. Okay, I want to leave people at 21 years old uh, and then take action, which is what my mom taught me. Don't talk about it, be about it. Some things you, you work really hard for, but you gotta go for it. They're just not gonna show up at the door. So dream, focus, pray, act. That's kind of what I did. As we wrap up, there are people in the depths of despair right now who are going through domestic violence. Foster children who are getting ready to age out of the system. Number one, what is your message to people who are in a domestic violence situation right now. There are so many resources available to help you get out of it. Share your story with somebody, share your burdens with somebody. Uh, that's what my mom did uh, and they helped her finally get out of it. There are resources around and we know a lot of the resources. We know the Family Place, we know Genesis Women's Shelter, we know uh, that there's so many, uh, the, the, the women, Call Moses, uh, so many organizations that will help people, uh, but don't lose hope. Know that you are bigger than your circumstances. Know that you deserve so much better. Know that the Lord has a plan for you, and it's a plan to prosper you and not harm you and to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29 and 11. That's actually what I would tell them. Reach out to people. We're here to help. We are here to help. Your message for foster children that they matter, that they are also bigger than their circumstances, that we love them, that we care about them, and that we are here for them, and we are looking for forever families uh, for them, and that they can make it. And I, I have four in my house, right? well, they're not in my house right this second, okay. uh, but raised four, um, and one was in foster care for a very, very long time. One actually aged out uh, of foster care. And so I want them to know that they are special, they are loved, uh, they are at risk of greatness. Uh, when I hear that term all the time, at risk, I said, these kids are at risk. They're at risk of greatness. They're at risk of having big dreams and living out those dreams. And then there's a whole community here in this Dallas region, a whole community here to support them and help them. And uh, we, we want to be a part of their lives, and we are a part of their lives. Congratulations, the Dallas Mavericks in the second round of the playoffs yes! since 2011. Woo! Round two, round two, yes. And we got something to do tonight. We got something to do here tonight, and we will. I know our guys are happy to be home and happy about this big crowd that will be here tonight. And so I just want to say thank you to all of our fans, our fans who have been showing up for us all season, our fans who have had faith in us even when we are going through a crisis, even when we have uh, headlines, even when they don't know what's real and not what's real. They are here for us. And so I love our fans. I love you. I love what you do every day. And you keep doing your Wednesday child thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to turn off the television. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I know, right? You, yes. You, you've yes. done your part. I have. Okay. So we'll talk about your book in a minute. And, okay. But as we wrap, finish this sentence. Uh-huh. I get really upset when? People don't tell the truth. I get really pumped up when? There are people around focused on a purpose, focused on a cause. Outside of faith and family, because I know how important that is to you, outside of faith and family, I'm strengthened by? Service. That's what just really makes me strong is serving people, serving others, having my hand out there to pull them, pull them forward. This world will be a better place if? We all step up and realize that we have a role to play and play that role. I would tell nine-year-old Sint Marshall that the, there's a big world out there. There's a big world out there that's bigger than the place that she's in right now. There are loving people out there. There are people who want her to do great things, and they're going to invest in her, and one day she has to do the same thing and pay it for it. Let's look ahead to retirement. What does retirement look like to you? Where are you going and what are you doing? Well, I tried it once and it didn't work. Okay. So at some point we're going to try it again. And so I think what, what it looks like after phase two, because at this point I just say it's in phases. So I probably like never retire. So I'm in phase two now. Okay. So by the time I get to phase three, I think phase three looks like, I describe it with three B's, uh, books, boards, so corporate boards, nonprofit boards, and better. Just what can I make better? What nonprofits need me? What schools might need me? Just keep open to, because it could be something like the Mavs. I mean, I never would have thought I'd be working in basketball, but somebody called me because they wanted it to be better. And so now I'm open to that. So books, boards, and better. Be honest, do you like working with Mark Cuban? Oh, I love it. I love my boss. I do. Uh, it's an adventure every day. He has a new idea often. Uh, he is no nonsense, which I love. And it's so funny because, you know, I've, I've been in the working world for, you know, 41 years. And so I said, fin finally, like I have the boss that I need. I have just the right kind of boss because he is smart. He trusts me. Uh, he treats me like an equal. He wants to hear my opinions. He lets me do my thing. I like that. He is intuitive. What if he didn't let you do your thing? Well, you wouldn't be talking to me. I mean, I have to be able to do, I mean, that's why he hired me. Because that's why I hired the people that I hired. Because they are experts and they know what they're doing. So you, leaders, great leaders, have to listen to their people, learn from them. In fact, that's my, you know, I have three L's of uh, leadership. My three L's. <laughs> to be an effective leader, you have to listen to the people, learn from the people, and love the people. And my mm. boss does listen to me. He learns from me. And I truly believe he loves me. Okay. So it's all good. He's the right kind of boss. And he is, uh, he loves the, this community. He has a huge heart. Sometimes people see it, sometimes uh, they don't. Uh, but he's all about what can he do for people. He doesn't like labor over it a lot. It's okay, let's do this. Let's go help them. Let's make it happen. He loves the players. Uh, so he's all about them, their well being. He's all about what can we do to serve them, their families. Uh, but he's like that too with our employees. What can we do to serve everybody in this organization? So he is a good guy. And, and I love the fact that he's no nonsense. What you see is what you get. So he's not trying to sugarcoat a lot of stuff. And at my age, I don't need stuff sugarcoated. Just like, mm -hmm. give it to me. What do we need to do different and all that? And he wants to know what do I need in order to be successful. And what I love, too, about him is he keeps his promises. Mm -hmm. He promised me that he'd teach me the business of basketball. And that he also promised me that he, you know, let me lay out that 100-day plan and execute on it. And he's done that. He's done that. And so I like a boss with integrity. And he definitely has integrity. He, he epitomizes our, our values. And, of course, I didn't know that. I, did, I didn't know him. And so he, he asked me to do something. I said, okay. I spent an hour with him and said, okay, seems like a great guy. I did my research. Um, but I, um, I'm pretty happy. I'm pretty happy with my boss. And you happy about the fact you got a book coming out? Yes. Congratulations. Finally, after 10 years. It's about, it basically, it's about my cancer battle. I did a, a, a Caring Bridge journal post. So every round of chemo, I just came out with the good, the great, the bad, and ugly. I just posted what was going on with me. And so over the years, it has uh, served as a tool to help people who are either going through chemo or who are 
uh, who have family members going through it. And so I get calls for it all the time. And I had stage three colon cancer. Mm. So one lymph node away from stage four, pretty bad uh, prognosis. And that was December of 2010. Uh, so I am still here by the grace of God and some great doctors and the help of a lot of people. And so it kind of tells that story. So we've taken the journal and people have been telling me all these years to turn into a book. And I'm like, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. So in all of my airplane rides in 2019, I said, okay, I'm going to take every round of chemo, all 12, and I'll tell a little story around it and give more flavor than that's, you know, yeah. than I posted. And then these publishers got a hold of it and said, there's more here. There's more here because you were equipped for this battle and you were chosen for this battle. Cause I've always said, I, I've been chosen. I've been chosen. I think everybody who goes through something like that, you are chosen for that particular class that year to go through it. And so they said, no, obviously you've gone through adversity in your life and you were equipped for that, which I do believe I was. And that's something I actually put in a letter to my employees that I'm uniquely qualified for this cancer battle. And I told them why. And so the publishers jumped on that and said, we have to tell more than the cancer story. We have to tell a little bit of the backstory because it helps people really thrive through adversity. And so that's the name of the book. You've been chosen thriving through the unexpected. Looking forward to reading it. Yes. September. Stand by. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Love you too, sir. Thank you.